Hi, I'm Rebecca Samolski. I'm the director of Fire Adapted Colorado, and I'm joining you today from the southwesternmost corner of Colorado near the Four Corners. Um, these are the homelands of the Nauch or Ute people, and the Diné or Navajo people, and the ancestral homelands of the Pueblo who stewarded this landscape for millennia. My office that I'm joining you from is at the Dolores Volunteer Fire Station, where I dabble in wildfire response mostly in the summertime, in addition to my primary duty since 2018 as the director of Fire Adapted Colorado. For FACO, or Fire Adapted Colorado, I support professionals who lead wildfire resilience in your communities and the partners who support various aspects of wildfire preparedness like many of you. We provide a statewide peer learning and impact network, put on a statewide wildland fire conference every year and a half. The next one will be in Fort Collins the second week of April next year. And we serve as a collective voice advocating for better policy and program administration for wildfire preparedness and mitigation efforts in Colorado. When the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also referred to as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, or you may hear it just called Bill, even the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Bill for short, <laughs> uh, when it was signed into law in the beginning of November, there was this ripple of excitement and anticipation for what it included as significant planned investments in landscape and community resilience to wildfire. And I started getting questions and requests for support from collaborative groups that were wanting to be ready to capture this bill funding for their landscapes and their communities. Um, Katie McGrath Novak, uh, who's on here today, um, helping with our um, She's going to be facilitating questions in the chat and sharing links. We had a meeting scheduled and she was just starting her role exploring a forest collaborative network with the Center for Collaborative Conservation. And she was also hearing interest in the bill. And since that time, Katie's been busy building the new forest collaborative network designed to benefit and support place-based forest collaboratives in Colorado by connecting them to information, resources, and each other and by telling their stories to make their values and needs understood, laying the groundwork through one-on-one -on -one interviews, regional listening sessions, a newsletter, and ultimately planning to host a Forest Collaborative Summit. So Katie's working behind the scenes today, and she has done the heavy lifting of laying out the agenda, coordinating calendars, and tracking the speaker responses to pull this together for you all. The Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership works on federal state policy on behalf of and in partnership with a coalition of more than 60 partners representing the hunting, fishing, and outdoor recreation advocacy groups and business community. TRCP is currently focused on addressing universal policy and institutional barriers to watershed and forest collaborative groups in accessing federal funds for watershed protection and restoration. Their interest and support of watershed protection work brought Alex to the table um, and he reached out to the Center for Collaborative Conservation to plan a workshop on the bill. So that's how Alex got into this with us. The Southern Rockies Fire Science Network has been fostering the productive exchange and use of science-based wildfire knowledge among researchers, managers, and communities since 2010 through partnerships, in-person and virtual events like this one, and online information sharing. Gloria Edwards and Angela Hollingsworth with CERSEN supported planning and outreach for this event. The Colorado Forest Restoration Institute is an ecological restoration institute that was stood up in 2005 to compile and apply locally relevant evidence-based knowledge to restore and enhance the resilience of forest ecosystems, watersheds, and communities to wildfire and other disturbances. We invited Chaska Huayuaca to the table, who's been following and supporting conservation collaboratives with CFRI for the better part of the last decade. Uh, most recently leading the Northern Colorado Fireside Collaborative, one of CFRI's collaborative projects on the front range to bring together Northern Colorado partners vested in increasing the scale and pace of forest restoration by putting fire back into the watershed management toolbox. And Chaska helped develop the agenda and invite uh, speakers and participants. And last but certainly not least, Brad Peel, with JW Associates, who's kept the Watershed Wildfire Protection Group alive. This is a group that originally formed as part of the Front Range Roundtable to identify hazards to water supplies from wildfires in Colorado. And today, the Watershed Wildfire Protection Group 
is a diverse group of watershed stakeholders, including the major water providers on the Front Range, federal and state land management agencies, and many watershed-based collaborative groups. Thanks to Brad for helping to think through the content, inviting speakers, and sharing this out to the groups on your WWPG email list. So those are the partners who are bringing this together for you today. And just a quick what we're going to hit here, and then we will get going. Um, so we'd originally hoped to bring you this presentation a couple months ago, but as you might have figured out, there's a lot unraveling to figure out how to implement the bipartisan infrastructure law. We decided to start with this session that's geared toward helping forest collaborative leaders and stakeholders better understand what programs already exist that are likely to get an infusion from the infrastructure investments or authorities that can be leveraged to help put this funding to work in our landscapes. Alex Funk is gonna kick us off in a minute with important background information. Then we'll jump to presentations on some of the funding and authorities to help you realize your forestry projects. We've asked each presenter to provide you with background on existing programs, including who's eligible and what landscapes. If known, what the increased investment from the bill and those timelines might look like for allocation and timelines on the funding opportunities and how to be competitive, including examples from past collaborative success and how to keep up um, with more in the future. They'll uh, each try to present about 10 minutes and then we'll take up to five minutes for questions. We're gonna try and save 10 minutes at the end um, for additional questions and a real quick evaluation on the day before we end at 11. So let's turn it over to Alex. Um, I'm gonna, the, this is the, what we have going. I'm not gonna read it to you all. Okay. Um, I apologize. It looks like somebody accident, somebody popped into our meeting and left something not very nice in the chat. So please ignore the message from Ezekiel. Um, I apologize. We got somebody in here that shouldn't have. <laughs> um, all right. Alex Funk is the Director of Water Resources for the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. He is focusing on informing uh, the implementation of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act to direct additional federal resources to support multi-benefit projects with a focus on restoring headwaters, riparian and wetland ecosystems to enhance climate resilience. TRCP is also working on developing a policy platform on addressing universal barriers to watershed groups and asset accessing federal funds in Colorado and other Western states. And he's gonna provide us an overview this morning on the infrastructure law and what it lays out for these groups. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, Alex uh, Funk, Director of Water Resources, uh, TRCP, uh, based out of Denver. Uh, and I'm going to give a quick, very high level overview of, you know, some of the uh, climate resilience, forest ecosystem restoration funding opportunities, um, which some of the other speakers will go into a deeper dive on. Um, and I'll kind of just highlight a few uh, resources that collaborators might find useful that have come out in recent months that provide a little bit more guidance <coughs> on uh, the infrastructure opportunities. So just a little bit about TRCP. Um, Rebecca did a really great overview, but you know, in short, we're uh, an advocacy organization. Uh, we work with uh, over 61 different diverse partnership groups to further federal and state conservation policy. Um, very active in Colorado um, and have a you know, number of members here, um, you know, particularly within the hunting and fishing community. Uh, we've been really focused on the infrastructure law of late, given the amount of funding um, available, um, particularly for climate resilience um, opportunities. Um, and so, uh, you know, and are continuing to work on addressing uh, barriers to accessing some of these opportunities and directing some of these resources to uh, Colorado and other Western states. So just a quick recap. Um, so the Bi Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act um, signed into law uh, last November. Um, it is a massive piece of legislation. Um, it's a little unique in that it both authorizes and appropriate spending uh, for most programs, but not all. Um, and so in short, that means uh, the funding um, that's included in this bill is available um, now. Um, it is not necessarily subject to additional appropriations. Um, the legislation itself, um, 
for most programs generally authorizes the funding for five years. And so we're, you know, kind of thinking out in terms of, you know, this funding is available for the next four years or so through the end of fiscal year 2026. Um, and as I sort of mentioned at the top, um, just massive investments, um, particularly in terms of climate resilience. So there's about um, a little over 50 billion um, available through, you know, multiple federal agencies to address, um, you know, climate, you know, or natural hazards, everything from drought, floods to wildfires, um, with improvements to both physical and natural infrastructure. So it includes a very heavy focus on um, potentially using nature-based or natural infrastructure approaches to um, enhance climate resilience. Uh, a significant portion of the funding that's available in the infrastructure law um, is available mostly through formulas to states and tribes, um, but about 40% is competitive. Um, you know, so through either existing grant programs or new grant programs or other sort of cooperative agreements, um, quite a bit of the funding um, still requires, you know, some sort of external application process um, wherein entities have to apply for and then compete with other proposals. Um, that said, there is quite a bit of funding available through more like direct spending. I think a lot of the forest service funding in particular is more internal funding formulation. So um, a little bit different, but, you know, things like the Water Smart program that the Interior um, team will touch on, um, a lot of that is competitive and, and available through grants. Um, a lot of the funding, but not all, um, is available mostly through states, local governments, and tribes. Um, and so I think uh, it's kind of just important to highlight that even for those programs that aren't, you know, directly eligible for NGOs or, or collaboratives, there's still a lot of opportunity to work with uh, state and local governments and tribal partners in terms of developing projects um, and helping them, you know, sort of maybe put proposals forward um, that otherwise NGOs aren't eligible for. But that said, there are still quite a number of programs that I think some of the other speakers will touch on that, uh, you know, private organizations are also eligible for. So I know we've got a pretty stacked uh, speaker list. Um, I just wanted to touch on um, you know, so overall, in terms of wildfire management, um, there's 8.25 billion um, between USDA and, and DOI. And I know some of our speakers are going to kind of touch on some of those. I just wanted to briefly highlight that in terms of sort of forest restoration management, um, sort of natural infrastructure approaches and sort of source watershed and fire mitigation, there are other, you know, potential buckets to kind of just be on a lookout for. Um, across other federal agencies. And so there's, there was a significant investment in the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, um, you know, which can potentially be utilized for uh, sort of source water, forested <clears throat> watershed investments. There's the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, which is available through the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which, which has funded, um, you know, sort of fire resilience projects in the past and, and can, uh, can continue to be a focus of um, USDA has some funding available through the Watershed and Flood Operations Program, which uh, potentially can fund uh, fire mitigation and other sort of, you know, forest management um, opportunities. And then I, I thought I would just kind of plug this uh, uh, sort of new opportunity, just America the Beautiful Challenge. Um, this is funding that's from the infrastructure bill across a few different buckets that's been consolidated into a sort of single uh you know, uh, grant portal that's going to be administered through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, this will be offered on an annual basis for the next, you know, starting this year and the next four years with a focus on large scale voluntary landscape restoration and conservation. Um, I'll provide a link in the chat when I'm done um, talking, but uh, those proposals are currently, that RFP is currently open um, and proposals are open through the end of July. Uh, I just wanted to highlight, you know, so TRCP has been pretty active in kind of getting a better understanding of what some barriers are to potentially accessing these funds for collaboratives. And the main main one that we've certainly heard about is, is capacity in terms of the ability and sort of resources to apply for or access programs. Um, and so the bill does a pretty good job in terms of providing some resources to that effect. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few that others might touch on, but um, I just wanted to note that there is a hundred million in the infrastructure bill itself to support uh, collaboration and collaborative based activities under the uh, collaborative forest landscape restoration program. So this is a hundred million set aside specifically for planning um, for those projects. Um, 
I know the National Forest Foundation has been pretty active in working with the Forest Service to sort of refine and kind of develop what this program has looked like. But, you know, just to kind of highlight that there are some resources there. Um, the administration has developed this Rural Partners Network. Um, this will put federal staff on the ground through USDA Rural Development um, in select states. I think the goal is to have all 50 states at, at one point or at a point in the future, but for now they're kind of rolling that out. Um, I believe Arizona and New Mexico um, are two pilot initial states, but essentially kind of creating a network in which uh, agencies can help, you know, local applicants uh, sort of navigate um, some of these programs. Uh, I'll just kind of plug, you know, I know this is more of a sort of watershed, water element programs, but there are two uh, reclamation programs that I just wanted to highlight that do support broader watershed restoration and collaborative um, kind of planning. That's the Cooperative Watershed Management Program, uh, which is an existing program, but gets a significant um, increase in funding through the infrastructure law. And then the Multi-Benefit Watershed Health Improvement Program, which is new um, and will include some set-asides for planning and design for multi-benefit projects, um, including watershed restoration. Uh, Finally, I just wanted to note Colorado um, in particular has been pretty active in, um, you know, sort of investing in some resources to help expand capacity to access um, infrastructure dollars. And so there were two um, pieces of legislation that passed um, this past session that just wrapped up um, that I wanted folks to kind of just be aware of. Um, the first is HB 22. Uh, 1379. This is the Wildfire Prevention and Watershed Restoration Funding um, Bill. Uh, it sets aside 20 million from Colorado stimulus funds from the American Rescue Plan Act um, to the Colorado State Fire Service and Department of Natural Resources uh, for the next two years. Um, and here's a little bit, a little bit of the breakdown. But there's three million um, going to the Healthy Forests and Vibrant Communities Fund. Uh, 2 million to support wildfire mitigation capacity development. So those are both through the State Forest Service. Um, and then there's 10 million for watershed restoration and flood mitigation. That's through the Water Conservation Board. Um, I think most importantly, there's 5 million um, uh, for agency capacities so that would go to the Water Conservation Board to provide additional resources to help with grant development. Um, but there's also 2.5 million for collaborative capacity. And so, um, that funding will be available through the Colorado Water Conservation Board uh, to support, um, you know, uh, local governments and NGOs in terms of expanding their capacity to, you know, develop projects, do grant writing, um, and other sort of uh, activities. Um, just had a call with DNR yesterday, and it sounds like we'll probably see guidelines um, for those resources in, in July, um, but that funding will be available hopefully sometime later this summer. And then there was the other bill, um, SB 22215. Uh, this creates a special fund within the governor's office, um, specifically for state agencies, uh, local governments, and tribes to set aside a sort of dedicated matching fund pool. Um, so there's 80 million that's sort of set aside um, in terms of um, supporting um, uh, water environmental and resiliency projects, which is pretty broad. And we, we haven't seen any guidelines on this yet. Um, but in short, um, the governor's office will be kind of setting up a process by which state and local governments and tribes can then apply to uh, this program um, to match uh, uh, federal um, programs. So exciting to see that, and um, especially for some of those competitive funds, um, Colorado has been you know, pretty active in ensuring that there are resources in place to um, access those resources. Um, and then in closing, I just want to kind of highlight and I'll, you know, definitely share the slides with Rebecca on the way out, but um, just wanted to note that the administration has put out quite a few resources to help kind of provide more guidance on what's available in the infrastructure law. Um, so the, there's the Building a Better America Guidebook, um, which covers the entire Infrastructure Act. Um, there's a rural playbook that um, sort of focuses on programs that are uniquely available for um, sort of rural communities, tribes, and how, you know, and sort of guidance on how to access those. Um, just very recently, they released a technical assistance guide, so opportunities on terms of how to, you know, kind of secure, um, you know, capacity resources to access programs, and so that's now available. Um, and then Colorado um, actually has put together a really excellent funding opportunity navigator, which includes a lot of these infrastructure programs uh, with links to uh, program um, 
web pages, uh, managers, and then um, you know sort of criteria and uh, who's eligible. So really great resource. Um, and uh, so anyway, a lot out there. Um, happy to answer any questions if there's still time, uh, Rebecca. But um, otherwise, yeah, thanks for having us this morning. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, we have time for a quick question. Or if anybody has a question, why don't you go ahead and drop them in the chat and we'll see if Alex can uh, answer those as we go because we are a little bit behind on time. So I'm going to keep us moving here if that's all right. And while Lindsay's getting her slides up, um, Lindsay Buchanan is the National Coordinator for the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, CFLRP, with the USDA Forest Service. This program encourages and invests in collaborative science-based approaches to forest landscape restoration to advance forest health, benefit rural communities, and reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfire. In her role, Lindsay provides policy guidance and technical assistance, supporting an active community of practice and sharing lessons learned within and beyond the CFLOR program. So Lindsay, take it away. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to have this opportunity to be here with you and share a little bit about the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, or CFLRP. So CFLRP was one of the first sort of national scale collaborative landscape restoration initiatives. Congress first authorized the program back in 2009. So I'll spend just a few moments sort of giving some background on the program, how we got here, and then we'll jump to where we are now and intersections um, with the bipartisan infrastructure law. So as was mentioned, this program is intended to encourage and invest in collaborative approaches to landscape scale restoration. So we work to advance ecological as well as economic and social outcomes including a specific focus on reducing wildfire risk, as well as enhancing watershed health and providing benefits to local communities. And in doing all of this, we leverage uh, public as well as private resources at different scales. And we've really seen this approach produce sort of outsized impacts on the ground. So providing significant contributions to our overall agency wildfire hazard reduction treatments, for example, um, and they've advanced integrated treatments, not only to reduce wildfire risk, but improve habitat, address invasive species threats, and so on. And we've learned that this work on the land um, generates significant benefits for the community, including economic benefits, so over $2 billion in local labor income, supported through these efforts to date. And we've also seen that every dollar of program funding invested has attracted a dollar eighty in partner contributions. And maybe what's more, um, you know, in, in surveys done with practitioners, we hear that they generally agree that they're seeing more restoration happening due to the collaborative approach, that the work is improving resilience and reducing conflict. So what's the mechanism for working towards these goals. So CFLRP is a competitive 10-year funding opportunity. Funding through the program can cover up to 50% of the cost of implementation and monitoring on national forest system lands. So the rest of the funding comes from other funding sources, be it from other forest service dollars, partner contributions, goods for services through stewardship contracting, um, just to give some examples of what that match can look like. Selected landscapes are required to do multi-party monitoring, so monitoring that includes multiple stakeholders sharing ownership of you know, collecting data, analyzing information, and making those results broadly available um, for adaptive management and good and transparent communication uh, with one another. This includes ecological, social, and economic monitoring, and the monitoring requirement is for 15 years. And we've seen this really be uh, a foundational piece of the program success. Okay, so we've talked about sort of what the money can fund. Let's talk a little more about where that funding comes from. And with the bill, we now have two potential sources of funding. 
So our traditional funding uh, comes through annual appropriations currently authorized by the 2018 Farm Bill through 2023. So that's generally where the funding for CFLRP has come from. We now have the infrastructure law as a funding source through section 40803E. Uh, and while that has some additional considerations in terms of prioritization for CFLR projects, they fortunately complement each other really well. So kind of starting with our traditional funding, the 2018 Farm Bill, these are just some examples of the eligibility criteria um, that need to be met for these projects. So they need to be at least 50,000 acres in size, mostly forested land, and developed and implemented through a collaborative process. And then the infrastructure funding sort of says, yes, and we wanna support projects with high wildfire potential located in the WUI and or drinking water sources. We wanna consider cost per acre, and we're gonna look at a track record of having past collaborative successes and a collaborative plan moving forward. So since 2009, we've had now 30 CFLR projects funded to date. We have 15 active projects that are supported this year, thanks to combined funding from our annual appropriation, that kind of traditional funding stream, as well as bill funding. So the stars that you see on the map represent six brand new projects that were announced last month that we don't have on our map yet. All right, so let's zoom in a little bit to take a look at Colorado. So Colorado has had four CFLR projects funded. The ones that you're seeing in purple are at the end of their 10 years of initial funding, so they're no longer uh, receiving new funding. And that's the Uncompagre Plateau there on the GMUG in Western Colorado and the Colorado Front Range Project. The gray landscapes that you're seeing include uh, two new projects that were funded this year, Southwest Colorado, and then we have the multi-state Rio Chama CFLR project that you'll see there in northern New Mexico up into Colorado there. You might also notice that there's a gray landscape that overlaps with the purple front range landscape. So the funding available to us this year wasn't enough to onboard all of the CFLR proposals that the secretary has approved. So uh, Colorado is certainly a very active CFLRP state. And just to show you kind of in table form, uh, the green projects are the ones that are currently active and currently receiving funding. And the ones in red more to the right have been approved by the secretary and have not yet been funded. So highlighting that in part to note the new Colorado Front Range project there on the right hand side. All right, so um, before I move to kind of some resources around CFLRP, I'll note that the bill does require that we have a new request for CFLR proposals that was announced in March. And essentially the CFLRP request for proposals process has two steps or two tiers. So there's an initial uh, pre-proposal that gets submitted to the Forest Service regional offices and the regional offices determine where there's strong alignment and invites generally a subset to move on and, and move to full proposal development or tier two. So the tier one deadline for the Rocky Mountain region, region two has passed, that was May 13th. And the tier two proposals will be due to the Washington office in October. They'll get evaluated by our advisory committee based on criteria that's outlined in the legislation from the strength of the ecological case to the strength of partnerships. So if you're a past, present, or potential future CFLR practitioner, we hope that you're connected in to our various communities of practice here. Uh, we just had a webinar session yesterday with the National Forest Foundation on multi-party monitoring. So if you aren't connected to these groups and you'd like to be, um, in just a moment, I'll share contact information for your regional CFLRP lead, as well as my contact information. Uh, so please feel very welcome to get in touch and, and get connected there. 
And I might just end with a reflection that we've really learned a lot through 12 years of CFLRP that we've seen can have value beyond CFLRP boundaries, right? So how we work across our land ownerships, uh, how we structure ourselves for resilient collaborative efforts, and best practices for multi-party monitoring. We've really benefited from evaluations and syntheses um, from partners and researchers like CFRI, um, and we've done our best to sort of compile these resources together in a CFLRP resource library that's available um, on our website. So always excited about opportunities to kind of um, share some of our lessons learned as their interest and value. All right, and with that, I will leave you with my contact information as well as the contact information for, again, your regional CFLR coordinator, Megan Lowell. And there's a link to our website at the bottom. So thanks so much for your time. Uh, we'll see if we've got a few moments for questions. Yeah, sure. Let's, I, I might just have to kick off a question to you, Lindsay, while others um, raise hands. And then uh, I see Brad has one in a second. So I just wanted to ask, um, you showed that list of CFLR landscapes that are already approved, but not um, appropriated yet. And so I'm curious with the timeline, uh, with the infrastructure legislation and other annual appropriations, um, it, is there real, is there really more money for more CFLRPs beyond, you know, what's already been approved? How do you see those being released from year to year? Yeah, appreciate that. And the short answer is we don't know yet. Our traditional appropriation goes through 23. Uh, we'll see if it gets reauthorized. It has been reauthorized once. As of now, um, we've got sort of one more year under our uh, program authorization. And so that's something that we're tracking very closely. We also don't know if we'll get flat funding through that funding stream from Congress or if there'll be, you know, shifts that can happen over time. Um, so we are required to have a request for new proposals. We've seen a lot of value in being able to show demand for the program. And we do really want to be clear and transparent that future funding is uncertain. We, we don't know yet. So thanks for highlighting that. Thanks. Brad, go ahead. Yeah, Beck and I are thinking along the same lines, I'm afraid, Lindsay. But uh, yeah, I was just thinking about that, you know, the projects that are approved and not funded yet. Now we're talking in this meeting about all this federal funding <laughs> that's available, right? So couldn't we like, it makes a lot of sense that those projects put together these proposals and partners and collaborative groups. And it's like, those seem like pretty good projects. And so it seems like we should be able to find some funding to go there, even if it's through some of these other avenues. Maybe that's too complex for you just to answer, but maybe we should, I don't know. That's just what, that's what uh, kind of stuck out as me. Yeah, thanks for that, Brad. And I can highlight that those projects are receiving funding through other avenues. So the Colorado Front Range project, for example, is, is a priority landscape, one of the sort of top places for investment for the agency across the country. And we might hear more about that later on. Um, so I can just sort of speak to the CFLR funding stream. A lot of these projects also receive Joint Chiefs funding. Um, so we are certainly not the only game in town, right? And, and we recognize that. Um, there is also funding for collaborative capacity building. I know Alex mentioned that earlier on in our session today. Um, so that's something that can sort of be complementary as well. So yes, absolutely. I think we can look across our funding streams to support this good work and all the work that went into the proposals. Cool. I have a good question from the chat and we'll get Alex and, we'll, and then we'll move on. Um, will you fund any treatment through CFLRP of acres that are outside of very high wild potential, wildfire potential, say as moderate? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so basically the, the bill includes high wildfire hazard as a prioritization criteria. It doesn't necessarily mean that treatments need to be exclusive to that. It's sort of a factor looking across the landscape, um, but there's no, there's no restriction on kind of where the treatments can be placed in that regard. Okay, great. So that's more of an overall prioritization to make sure that the areas getting selected overall have some, some very high risk. Um, exactly. Yeah, perfect. And then Alex, you'd had your hand up. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was going to take yours and then move along if you have something you want to bring up. 
Oh, I, and I think Lindsay mentioned it, but I, yeah, I guess any more details on the collaborative, I guess, capacity funding piece of CFR? Uh, do you have any sense of like how that's going to roll out or when that's going to be available or just like some process, I guess? <clears throat> yeah, happy to share what I know. So it's an interesting funding source and in that it's is supporting both CFLR projects. About three and a half million have supported projects off the list, as well as collaborative capacity building that doesn't need to be connected to CFLRP. Uh, and so I admittedly know less about that. I know, Alex, as you mentioned, there's been some webinars and conversations with the National Forest Foundation. I know that an initial um, allocation of 100,000 was made available to each region to kind of explore collaborative capacity building um, efforts in this year, kind of given the timing of when we got the funding as well. And the agency plans to collect feedback and explore options um, for adapting the program moving moving forward. So hopefully we'll have a chance to hear about that from other speakers later on in the session. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And um, I'm going to turn it over here to uh, Jonas Feinstein and Gretchen Runing. Jonas has been recently hired as the West Regional Conservation Forester with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, out of Portland, Oregon. He previously served for 12 years with NRCS as the state conservation forester for Colorado. And prior to that, he served the public for the Jefferson Conservation District uh, and the State Forest Service and the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. And Jonas holds two degrees in forestry from CSU. So uh, Colorado native just jumped to the national ship. And I'm also just going to... Um, in, introduce Gretchen as well, because these guys are going to team up and share with you a little bit about the Joint Chiefs um, program. Gretchen's role with the Larimer. Gretchen Erning is the Forest Program Director with the Larimer Conservation District, which has contributed to roughly 4,000 acres of restored forest and private lands in Larimer, Larimer County. Sorry, I can't speak this morning, folks. Um, since 2017, so 4,000 acres in those five years. 2,700 of those were enabled through partnership with the U.S. Forest Service and NRCS via the Northern Front Range Joint Chiefs Landscape Restoration Partnership. In addition to improving landscape scale resilience and forest health, this program funneled six and a half million into the local economy, capacity for logging contractors, improving wood product markets, and creating jobs. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jonas first. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Becca. Hey, folks. Um, I, I suppose I I don't have a sl I don't have slides to share with you um, because I wanted to make this quick and really, at the end of the day, show how this work uh, transitions to the uh, the work that takes place here um, on the ground with uh, with what uh, Gretchen's going to be presenting. Um, kind of high overarching. Uh, um, uh, viewpoint of where Joint Chiefs are, some really great, terrific news. It's been codified. It's in law, bipartisan um, development of, uh, of the sort of expanding um, the, the experiment, you know, just as Lindsay sort of, you know, presented to these uh, um, collaborative experiments, you know, where, where, they, where they land, how they overlap, and how they complement and um, really build off the idea that place-based collaboration and implementation without boundaries is, is a really important and um, really important and, and I, I suppose vital uh, perspective as we implement towards these shared goals, shared visions, shared values. Um, so as it goes, um, Good news is that Joint Chiefs is going to be funded uh, approximately $90 million annually um, with the focus that um, those, those landscapes, both private, non-federal, and forest system lands, um, have significant forest resources on there. there. Um, and the good news is Joint Chiefs of Soros sort of this moving target as to when um, when it was going to be announced 
and, and the like, it's going to now be publicly announced. So um, be expecting here in the next few, um, few days, potentially, that you'll see an announcement in the Federal Register um, that, um, that the uh, Joint Chiefs uh, FY23 proposals are going to be um, asked for. Um, so a few tips on, on what makes a really good, um, successful Joint Chiefs proposal. Um, of course, that it, it focuses on wildfire, watershed protection, and wildlife, and that they're really balanced proposals. I can't stress this enough. Um, in, the, in, in the attempt for securing funding for uh, targeted acres and landscapes, um, what was typically seen is that four systems um, across the country will ask for sort of very lopsided sums in a, in a landscape that is balanced by, equally balanced by private land. So you'll see a $32 million ask on one side of the fence and a $500,000 ask on the other side. The idea is that we want to see something that reflects true vision of cross-boundary um, implement planning, implementation, and engagement. So uh, the idea behind that, of course, as you can imagine, is that you have to have, or you ought to have, a really well-established collaborative. Everyone's got their poop in a group, so to speak, and that we are able to um, plan, coordinate, and implement consistently and, and, and in a complementary way across these landscapes that make them worthy of, of a, a joint chief designation and outside funding. This is, this is additional monies to both NRCS state budgets and the Forest Service um, regional and or um, um, Forest Supervisor's Office. So th this is, this is this is a really great um, opportunities for folks to um, to be ready to have something that's actionable and to ultimately be successful. Um, so start now, start now. Um, so we have a couple of great um, um, opportunities here, uh, or we've had past um, examples. The first Joint Chiefs in Colorado, we had three of them. Um, the first one is in Pagosa Springs, um, and then we followed up with the Northern Front Range, which Gretchen's going to speak to, and we just now had a new announcement for the Sangres um, down in Southern Colorado. And all these landscapes are um, both partnered um, across the fence, really hand in glove, deeply uh, collaborative, and, and I just want to say that um, if there's ever an opportunity to have a shared vision towards shared implementation of desired conditions across the landscape, Joint Chiefs, along with other programs like CLFRP, um, shared stewardship, all the like, how do I say it? They're, they're, all, um, they're all pieces of a puzzle to a dynamic vision. And and use, utilizing all these tools in a way that gives um, a robust response and action to uh, the challenges that our landscapes and communities are facing through wildfire hazard, um, degraded forest conditions, climate change, and the like um, can be met with, with um, these really cool tools, not just federal, but again, also towards the state um, state piece pieces of that puzzle as well. So it uh, takes many hands to make light work, and um, I'll I'll leave it at that. I'll hand it over to Gretchen. Thanks. Thanks, Jonas. Well, I just wanted to quickly uh, tie into what Jonas was talking about um, about the Joint Chiefs program with uh, just kind of a more of a specific example. And Becca's just playing a little bit of a slideshow in the background here, just some photos from um, one of the conservation districts projects up here in Larimer County at the 
former Shambhala Mountain Center, uh, now the Drala Mountain Center, um, where the Cameron Peak Fire came through um, two years ago. So um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on that idea of, you know, applying for this Joint Chiefs program up in our neck of the woods and how it quickly became a no-brainer uh, to put forward a proposal. Um, and that was more based on the existing collaborative that was already in place. Um, so that's the Northern Colorado Fireshed Collaborative up here, which I see a lot of different folks in, in the chat here from the group. So um, the, the Fireshed group up here is made up of a lot of different partners from federal, state, and local partners that are all working towards that same goal of forest restoration um, and ecosystem health and resilience. So, um, you know, the, that shared goal is a really important thing and uh, fits in really well with the Joint Chiefs program. Um, I also, you know, just to, to build on to what Jonas says, I think that existing collaborative really did help our case with the application and ultimately the, the implementation of the Joint Chiefs project that we had up here in Northern Colorado. Um, and one reason for that was the idea of shared stewardship um, has been kind of the, the culture here for a while. And so the idea of plugging in partner roles based on, you know, existing planning and staff capacity uh, on the landscape uh, towards that shared goal was um, pretty, pretty easy ultimately because it was already in place. Um, so the Joint Chiefs program that we had up here uh, went through from 2019 through 2021. And uh, it funded both NRCS and the US Forest Service $11.6 million. And that was to treat about 9,000 acres across both federal and non-federal lands uh, across the Northern Front Range. So those are just kind of the snapshot you know, numbers, metrics that everyone thinks about, but I kind of wanted to highlight some of the other benefits of the program as well, um, both on the landscape, in terms of ecosystem health and resilience and also within our communities. So um, some of those social benefits, you know, are one of the things that I think we tend to lose sight of when we're thinking about forest restoration. Um, but, you know, when we keep talking about the, the need for the increase of pace and scale of this type of work to address the, the problem at hand with wildfire risk, you know, um, the Joint Chiefs program was really beneficial for us. Um, and that's because it guaranteed funding so that we could really uh, even build on that capacity that was already existing. So we saw dozens of jobs created throughout this program, um, both with contractors, logging contractors, uh, hand crews, that sort of thing, but also with our fire shed partners, um, was just building capacity with staff to uh, increase you know, the planning and the implementation uh, pace that we needed up here. Um, we also saw a really good expansion of like wood product utilization from this effort um, and can attribute a lot of that to that steadier stream of funding. Uh, we also really experienced a lot of growth and social license up here um, with that idea of, you know, if you build it, they will come or uh, <laughs> keeping up with the Joneses. You know, we see, I work on the private land side, so we see folks taking on this type of work and then neighbors see what's happening and even see the results of some of these projects when fires come through. And it makes it really easy to uh, spread the word and build that social license in some of these communities. So aside from those social benefits, you know, obviously the ecological benefit is a huge, huge uh, portion of the Joint Chiefs program. Um, and we saw, uh, the reason I'm sharing the the Drala Mountain Center photos here is that we saw a really great example of this in 2020 during the Cameron Peak Fire. Um, because of this effort in Larimer County in Northern Colorado to um, complete this cross-jurisdictional work and shared stewardship, um, we saw the Forest Service prescribed fire, you know, in the Ping Pingree Hill prescribed fire um, treatment line up really well with the work that the conservation district at NRCS did at the Drala Mountain Center. And so when the fire came through there, it was able to kind of slow down and allow firefighters to get in and protect some structures and um, put in fire line and actually get ahead of the fire a little bit better. Um, so that was a huge advantage for downwind community. Um, big HOA was just downwind of this project area. So, 
you know, the, the proofs in the pudding, this, this program is really helpful for our communities, um, not just our, our uh, human communities, but also our wildlife and our ecosystem. So um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the Joint Chiefs program and would be happy to chat more offline with anyone or uh, answer any questions. All right, thank you so much, Gretchen and Jonas. Um, trying to keep my eyes out here. Uh, we have time for one question. If anybody has a question, I don't see any in the chat. I'll do a tag on there for you guys while I'm watching for hands. Um, just to think about size of properties that Joint Chiefs can apply to on private lands. So this looks like you treated a lot of uh, larger properties. I know in Southwest Colorado, I think that one. Um, had some more smaller properties. Jonas, how, how, what are those kind of parameters for what you can treat on the private land side? Yeah, thanks, Becca. Um, you know, really at the end of the day, NRCS to participate on farm bill programs, we don't have acreage limitations. That said, as we can all imagine, um, there are sort of the administrative overhead of managing, how do I say this, managing a thousand, a thousand uh, 10 acre contracts versus one, you know, 10,000 acre contract, so to speak. So the idea is to work smart, not hard, make the actions that you want to see on the ground work towards you and then leverage you know the way i always view it is take um take acres as an opportunity to pancake and leverage for those areas where uh acres may cost more but then also use other programs to pay for those those places where it may not be as um efficient administratively in, in administering those contracts. So again, just just looking at the portfolio of, of the land ownership and what pieces and programs fit into, um, into that landscape and that overall vision is really helpful. But at the end of the day, NRCS doesn't make any requirements of minimum or maximum acreage where we are uh, available to everyone that meets program eligibility. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jonas and Gretchen. Um, we're going to let, I do believe Nikki does have a slideshow presentation for us. Nikki McCann is the program analyst in the Water Resource and Planning Office at the Bureau of Reclamation, supporting the Water Smart program. So now to shift a little bit here towards thinking about the water. Through Water smart funding opportunities, Reclamation continues to work cooperatively with the states, tribes, and local entities to plan for and implement actions to increase water supply through investments to modernize existing infrastructure and attention to local water conflicts. And this does include watershed scale forestry stuff as well, which is why we're um, bringing in Nikki to visit with us. So take it away, Nikki. Thank you very much for having me. Um, as we mentioned, I'm representing the Bureau of Reclamation today. And we are going to talk about the Water Smart Program. First, very briefly, uh, from large scale, uh, the Water Smart Program for, um, for Reclamation does cover 14 different programs. This can range from anything from basin studies to water conservation to drought. But today, I'm going to focus on four main programs that are going to be more for the wheelhouse of collaboratives and fire. As we've already mentioned, that the Bureau of Reclamation is here for the purpose primarily of water. So all of these programs do have a water management aspect to them. And so we will cover that as we go through them. And like I said, I'm going to cover four of them very quickly, hopefully today, and give you an idea of what we have to offer for um, these types of groups. So the first one is our Cooperative Watershed Management Program. And right now we are offering phase one of this program. It is currently under review for fiscal year 22. So as you see, we are anticipating a new funding opportunity for this program in fiscal year 23. As many of you have mentioned that a lot of your programs require that collaborative planning. And here we are giving you the opportunity to do that collaborative planning. 
Our cooperative watershed management program is designed to establish or expand a watershed group. So if you would like to establish a group, develop those bylaws, those mission statements, bring stakeholders to the table, create watershed restoration plans, or do project design associated with a watershed restoration project, those are eligible activities. This will be the one funding opportunity that the Bureau of Reclamation offers that does not have a cost share requirement. You may request up to $200,000 for a program to be completed in two years, and that is going to be with no cost share. For being an eligible applicant for this program, we are looking for watershed groups. Um, so if you're an existing watershed group and you need to do additional planning specific project design, you can come to this funding opportunity to do that design. You can also develop a watershed group and it should be sponsored by a state, a tribe, a local or special district, such as an irrigation district or water district, a local government entity, interstate organizations or nonprofit organizations. So we do have a very broad range of who is eligible for this program. And this is one of our planning programs that we offer. And it will be the only big planning program that I'm gonna to discuss today. For the other three programs that I'm going to discuss, I do wanna to touch on the eligible applicants. Our category A applicants are going to be people who are states, counties, tribes, irrigation districts. Predominantly, these are people who have one or more of the organizations that have power and water delivery authority. And we are located in the 17 Western states. We're one of the federal agencies that does not work across the entire country. But we do also have Alaska, Hawaii, some of the islands and territories as well. So if you're a category A applicant, you are um, able to apply for all of these. We do also have this category B applicant which is going to be your nonprofit conservation groups acting in partnership or an agreement though with a category A applicant. And so that's what makes our program just a little bit different is that all the collaboratives can come and apply, but you do need to have somebody who is a category A applicant as, on, as being a partner that's on board with you doing these projects. So that can be a state, a county, an irrigation district, a water district, a municipality, a city, Anybody who has that power and water delivery authority or as described as a category A applicant. And then lastly, one of our programs, we do also have a category C applicant. We don't see these very often, but it's a nonprofit organization looking to do work on federal lands to improve a condition of a natural feature. And for that, you do need to have a letter showing that uh, you have participation in the area and that nobody has objections and everyone has been notified. So now that we have all of our ideas of who our eligible applicants are, we're gonna look at our projects. We do have three programs that have been authorized both through our regular programs, as well as through the BIL that having expanded our programs within WaterSmart. Our first is our environmental and water resource projects. These projects are going to be looking at water conservation, drought related impacts, watershed management and restoration benefits, but they do all need to have ecological values. So we are looking for projects that are going to support those ecological values, do have some sort of connection to water conservation, watershed management, or improving conditions of a nature-based solution. We are offering funding for this through our Water Smart Grants and our Cooperative Watershed Management Program, which we will discuss where the funding for BIL is laying at the end of the presentation. And we do have a non-federal cost share of 25 to 50%, depending on the connection to a collaborative planning effort. So once again, like many of these other programs, we're seeing that this collaboration of those planning efforts and having everybody at the table really is making an impact on these projects and the funding available for that. We are expecting this funding opportunity to be available in August of 2022. And that will be for FY23 funding. The new authorities to reclamation as well as BIL funding has two new programs. This is gonna be the first one, the multi-benefit projects to improve watershed health. This is a new competitive program that is currently under development, but it will be eligible for the design, implementation, and monitoring of habitat restoration projects that improve watershed health. 
This project does have to have a connection to a basin impacted by a reclamation project. There are a few reclamation projects in Colorado, so this would be tied into uh, being in a basin with one of those uh, reclamation projects. And we are looking at a non-federal cost share of 25 to 50%. And then our last project, the program that we have associated with our environmental projects is going to be our aquatic ecosystems restoration and protection projects. This is also a new uh, program currently under development we do anticipate having project lists and criteria out for public review later this fall, and we're going to be looking for the study, design, and construction of aquatic ecosystem restoration and protection projects. These are to improve habitats, fish passages, including the removal or bypass barriers, and we're going to prioritize these projects um, for regional benefits across multiple places. So we're looking for big projects that will help. They have an aging infrastructure strategy, and they are going to impact larger areas, um, basin-wide, multiple um, aspects. We are looking at a 35% cost share for construction and 100% for operating and maintenance of these new projects. For these specific programs that we discussed, did you want to touch on a little bit of the infrastructure bill, but I will also show you a table on the next one that we do have specific funding for the aquatic ecosystems and restoration projects and the multi-benefit projects associated with the BIL funding. And that is going to be $250 million for aquatic ecosystem restoration and $100 million for multi-benefits. The uh, environmental and water resource projects, those do take funding from the Water Smart Grants, which also includes our conservation, water conservation projects, which did receive $400 million. And then our Cooperative Watershed Management Program received $100 million in BIL funding. Many of you are asking, how is this money going to be distributed over time? Is this money available now? How are we looking at it? And so what I'm showing on this slide is a graph of the uh, spend plan for 2022-2023 and the total funding associated with each of these programs. So as you can see, the Aquatic Ecosystems Restoration Program, the funding is not going to be available until 2023, with the majority of that funding being available between 2024 and 2026, as well as multi-benefit projects to improve the ownership health. That is also a program. Like we said, they're currently under development. We are seeing that that funding will be available in 2023 to 2026. The other two programs for our environmental water resources projects and our cooperative watershed management program, we do have funding available in 2022 and 2023, as well as a chunk of funding in the additional years. So the question that was posed to all presenters is how can people be successful in applying for grants? These are all competitive grants. And one recommendation that we have is that we do post all of our successful applications on our website. So you can go there and see how other people have addressed the criteria in the past. We do host webinars prior to all of the funding opportunities coming open to discuss the criteria associated with them. You can uh, sign up for information about our funding opportunities on our website. We do have a list that you can select as many of the programs you would like to hear about. And we also do offer consultations as those funding opportunities are open where you can talk to a program coordinator one-on-one. -on -one. And all of our grants will be available at grants.gov as they are competitive. And with that, that is a lot of information I know. So <laughs> I tried to stay in my 10 minute window with four programs and I'm hoping that if anyone has questions, we're happy to help. That was awesome, Nikki. You caught us up a little bit, so I appreciate that. Uh, please uh, find that reactions button and raise your hand if you have a question for Nikki or feel free to drop it in the chat. I haven't seen any pop up in the course of your con conversation, so uh, you must have covered it really, really well. <laughs> As many of the presenters have shown, I will show you that Colorado has been wildly successful in our cooperative watershed management program. This is a graph of everybody who has been selected or completed projects with um, the polygon shapes of being those watershed groups that we are developing in Colorado and little dots as being actual on the ground projects that have been implemented. Colorado was very successful in this program. Great. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands or questions for you, so I'm going to keep us rolling here because we still have a bit of content to get through. 
And our next presenter is going to be Steve Orr, sorry, Steve Lohr with the um, USDA Forest Service Region 2. He's the Acting Deputy Regional Forester, and I really appreciate you, Steve, being willing to come in with a lot of your regional staff in one meeting today. We, we started out trying to uh, hold this meeting, as I said, a couple of months ago, and we're really struggling to get the go-ahead um, to, to share stuff. The Forest Service wanted more stuff to share, and I really appreciate you reaching out to your other uh, program administrators to get some details on how they run their various programs uh, within the USDA Forest Service. So take it away and uh, let me know if you need any support with screen share or anything like that. All right, I may. And so y'all are stuck with me because there's a there's a tanker based grand opening today. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna pinch hit and hopefully I can do it justice here. Um, so uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. I'm trying to navigate two screens and a presentation and some notes here. So let's see if I can make it work. I can make up some stuff about you as we're going. I know that you're coming up here from the South and we can tell that by your accent, so. <laughs> I am, I'm a South Carolinian by, by nature, but that's okay. Um, let's see here, I'm trying to figure out, can, you can't see that yet, can you? No, you, you might just have to hit the share button then. All right, let me, let me hit the share button. It's, it's like toggling, so I'm struggling here a little bit. I'm the only one that's having techn technological issues, so. All right, let's see this one. Can you see it? Yep, we see it with your slides down the side still. Okay, let me see if I can change that. How about now? There you go. Looks good. All right. There you go. All right. Now, Perfect. my notes have disappeared. So I'm going to just bear with me for one second. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, let me see what I can do here. Mine do the same thing, Steve. I've been switching between screens and from one, it will it'll broadcast okay. to the other one just fine. And if I don't have it on the right screen to start with, it won't do it right, so. All right, well, I think I got it now. So oh. if, if y'all are good, I'm good. All right, so as was mentioned, my name is Steve Lohr. I'm the acting uh, deputy regional forester for the Rocky Mountain Regional Forest Service. I, my normal job is uh, the, the director of renewable resources. So I cover all the veg management programs for our five state Rocky Mountain region, which it was basically Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas. So the majority of our region is in Colorado. Um, and I know that's what the emphasis is today here. So we have 11 national forests and grasslands in, in Colorado. And so really excited about the opportunity to speak today. Uh, and and all, the, all the presenters have provided excellent information here. And so I'm looking to just kind of build on that. You know, as we move forward with this unprecedented opportunity that we have from funding, our success is going to rely on the working relationships we have with, with partnerships, uh, collaborators, um, tribal members, states, uh, and, and you know, all of our stakeholders that are involved. Uh, we're doing significant work in Colorado, in Colorado now. There's a lot of emphasis on Colorado, and you're going to see that as I go through the presentation. Um, the work that we've done to this point has really prepared us well for the implement, implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law. I'm going to call that bill. So we'll just, uh, you know, we're, we're all about acronyms in the Forest Service. So rather than say bi infra uh, bipartisan infrastructure law the whole time, I'm just going to say bill. But the bottom line is all the work that we're doing here is interconnected and we're going to need all of our available tools and authorities to implement projects to move the needle on the landscape. So I'm going to figure out how to advance my slide. Nope, that's not it. Let's see here. Again, bear with me. Oh, there we go. That might be it. You guys see that? Yep. All right, good deal. So the bottom line for, for us in the region, we've got three regional priorities. So creating resilient landscapes, which is what I'm gonna talk about uh, today, providing outstanding recreation opportunities and improving the work environment. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit on the recreation front before I move really into the into the veg treatment work. I, I think you know, a lot of times we miss an opportunity in the, in the uh, 
land management arena to not engage the recreation community more. I mean, they're the beneficiary of all this work we do. And so I, I think it's really important and goes hand in hand, creating these resilient landscapes results in outstanding recreational opportunities. And we appreciate that in our region and we're focused on that for sure. So let me continue to move the slides. There we go. All right, I think I've got this figured out now. So the, what does the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law do for us in, in the Forest Service? So, um, you know, we it's it, we knew it was coming and it's a long time coming for us. But, you know, the reality of it for us is it's, it's going to give us a lot of opportunity to work at a larger scale than we've been working at. We've been trying to scale up for years, but the reality is that we've, we've not had the resources to do that. So we're looking now at a significant pulse of funds that are going to help put a down payment on the work that we're doing. So we're, we're getting around $3 billion in the Forest Service for removing hazardous fuels. It, you know, it, it seems like a lot of money, but if you think about it in context, it's, you know, I'll, and I'll go into that a little bit later, it, it's not a ton of money, but it does give us an opportunity to really put a down payment on the work that we're doing. And so really excited about the opportunity to move forward in that arena. Let's see. Slide. All right. So to effectively deliver the infrastructure bill, our agency developed a wildfire crisis strategy, which basically calls for the treatment of an additional 20 million acres on national forest lands and 30 million on uh, state, tribal, and uh, non-federal lands. And so that's quite a chunk of uh, acres when you think about it. And so if you look at that $3 million figure, uh, or a $3 billion figure, that means that that's about 60 bucks an acre. So, I mean, if we're doing mechanical treatments on the front range alone, that's, you know, you're looking at 3,000 plus an acre. So it just gives you an idea of the scale that we're, we're trying to operate at and how this money is. Yeah, it's great to get it, but it's it really serves as a down payment to where we need to be. Uh, and then, you know, it's one thing to do the work, but it's also another to maintain that work. So in that strategy that the Forest Service developed, we identified uh, ways that we can increase our our treatments not only increase them but also increase our maintenance so in our region alone you know we've been treating probably around 190,000 acres a year in an ideal world we'd be treating closer to 600,000 acres so it's really over three times what we've been treating so it's a you know we've got a significant uh, road ahead of us to try to get that, get to that that point so for us, uh, we learned on, on April 11th that we received $18.1 million in, uh, in, wild, in wildfire crisis funding to treat, and that's from the infrastructure bill, to, to treat 10,000 acres across Colorado's front range. The initial projects, as you can look at this map, are uh, the Rapaho Roosevelt National Forest and the Pike San Isabel National Forest. And that's where the bulk of the work, at least the early work, is going to be focused. And yeah, there's good reason for that. The majority of the water that feeds the Front Range communities uh, from Denver is all, um, you know, that water originates from National Forest System lands. And yeah, really, it's about water uh, for us in the West. And then, you know, the, in, in Colorado alone, you know, we've, we've got a lot of water, almost all the water that, that you know, we get uh, on the Front Range originates on National Forest System lands. Uh, all, another interesting factoid, all water flows out of Colorado and none flows into it. So most of you guys that are, that are, that are water uh, folks get that. Um, the other thing I'd say is that, you know, this is not just Forest Service property. This is, this is a cross-jurisdictional effort, you know, between private lands, state lands, and we're really trying to um, you know, get uh, efficient, effective treatments that cross these boundaries. And so we've got lists of projects that we're going to be doing over the next 10 years. And now we're really trying to figure out how to gear up uh, to, to begin implementation now that we have the money. Uh, you know, we're focusing first on the highest priority fire sheds or, you know, we've got um, modeling that tells us where those are at and, and we're really working hard on those. And, and, you know, the other thing that I'd say is, you know, we've got a lot of other opportunities. We, you know, Joint Chiefs was mentioned. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. CFLRP was mentioned. Uh, and we've got good neighbor authority options that we've been working with the state on for years. And I know Matt Essenhauser is going to talk a little bit about that. So this, all this work is really collectively building towards uh, a more resilient landscape in Colorado. 
Uh, and the other thing is in 2019, we, we signed a shared stewardship uh, MOU with the state of Colorado that really lays a framework for how we're going to work together with the state to get this this collaborative work done on the landscape, and most uh, you know of our priorities are shared priorities with the states, and so that's really helpful as it as it comes to delivering programs. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative, and um, you, some of you have heard uh, about the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative. It's a uh, essentially um, you know our it's work that we are doing on focal landscapes, three focal landscapes uh, around the state of Colorado. We focus most of those efforts so far on Southwest Colorado, but essentially, it's a you know we're working very closely with collaborative uh, uh, with a collaborative that has more than forty partners across uh, uh, federal, state, tribal, and local jurisdictions to increase the pace and scale of forest restoration. So. Uh, you hear people talk about random random acts of restoration. So that's what this really was designed for. It was it was really to focus those efforts um, in, in some areas that we really had key challenges in and try to move the needle in those areas. And it really ties in well with um, with the Colorado Department of Natural Resources co-swap program where they're putting $17.5 million in, in, in stimulus dollars to do on the ground restoration. So we're really trying to tier all these funding streams to benefit uh, the state as a whole and make really strategic investments. Uh, we invest around $4 million a year as a forest service into the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative landscape. And it's really a, a, a super collaborative that has really set the stage for us delivering the infrastructure bill. So that's also exciting work that's happening. Um, I'd talk very briefly. Joint Chiefs was mentioned um, by the NRCS folks. And I'll just say that, you know, in 2022, we our region received about two and a half million dollars uh, of Joint Chiefs projects. And much of that is geared towards uh, front range type projects. And so I just wanted to point that out. The Joint Chiefs has been an awesome resource for our region over the years and will continue to be uh, continue to be so. So this is a busy slide and I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail, but, but these are a lot of the, the mechanisms that we use to deliver our programs. And a lot of these are grant programs that partners in the state um, have access to. So Widen Authority is not necessarily a grant program. It just allows us to work across jurisdictions. So we work a lot with private landowners to burn through their blocks of property or do work on their property as it benefits uh, both sides of the line. So Widen Authority allows us to do that collaborative work. And we have the volunteer uh, fire capacity and volunteer fire assistance grants. Um, those are available to the states also. Um, you know, we've, I think um, in the infrastructure bill money this year, we got about 127,000 uh, to go towards the, those programs. Uh, really, really good programs for us to get get money through the states as well. Uh, this, the state fire capacity and state fire assistance programs, uh, that's another uh, area where we've had bill funding. Uh, there's a 50-50 match requirement on, the, on these funds, but you know the, this is another one where we work really closely with the state on getting the on, on administering these grant programs. Uh, the bill increased um, our our traditional funding by three hundred and fifty thousand, and I think this year we're going to be granting two and a half million to the Colorado State Forest Service for projects on the ground. And then you have community assistance funds um, that for adjacent lands. Those are CAFA, and we we provide the state with lots of money, and that really we get proposals from landowners. Uh, homeowner associations, fire departments, and other partners that are really, you know, it's, a, it's about risk mitigation, wildfire risk mitigation. And we got, we got a lot of money this year, and, and uh, I think 300000 of that went to Colorado State Forest Service, but um, we do get around $2.3 million um, in funds, and a lot of that went to Wyoming this year, but Colorado has been the recipient of a lot of that money in the past. And then the, the wildland interface grants are they're a piece of the state fire capacity funds that are held off the top uh, for these WUI grants. And this year, Colorado received 1.1 million for four different projects. And so these are all really exciting opportunities for us. Um, community wildfire defense grants are another one, $160 million available nationally for that program in 20 in, in this fiscal year. Not sure uh, what where how much funds we'll get this year. So there's a lot of opportunity. And I will conclude with 
that the whole presentation was basically about opportunity, but there are some challenges for us. You know, capacity to set up grants and agreements is and and contracting. Uh, we did stand up a standalone contracting organization within the Forest Service to deliver um, infrastructure bill projects, um, but it's you know there, there's going to be a whole ton of of, um, of uh, contracts and also grants and agreements, and that capacity is limited, so that's going to be a challenge for us. Contractor capacity is going to be something that we're going to be concerned about. You know, if we're quadrupling the amount of work that we're doing on the landscape. Uh, are there enough contractors to even be able to handle that work? And then what is the cost? How does the cost reflect that? Uh, ability to recruit and retain a quality workforce. We're filling over 500 jobs in our region right now. And it's, we're, finding, we're, we're finding it very hard to get people. I'm just going to be honest with you. And, and then to, to retain them as well. There's a lot of opportunities for young folks out there now. And uh, it's just difficult for us to, to recruit like we need to. And we talk about this concept. You know, we used to talk a wildfire season, uh, but now we have a wildfire year with just uh, uh, just fires burning almost year round. And so, you can throw a few wildfires into the mix, uh, as you guys are aware from the fires we had here in 2020. It it can set you back uh, on a lot of your plans. And then, la final piece I'd say is around social license. A lot of people recognize the value of this work, but there are still others that are you know need some uh, need some more information to and and some. Uh, we have to do some work to get them where they need to be. And so that's always a challenge. So I'm going to leave it with that and turn it back over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Steve. And I, there were a couple of good questions that came up for you in the chat. So I'll go ahead and ask you those. Want us to just understand a little bit more about how the well, community wildfire defense grants are going to be made available and when? Um, okay, let me see if I can find that out these are the, the community wildfire defense grants i i think let's see i heard they're supposed to be released in july with hope of funding going out in september i do have an additional presentation that was shared with state foresters that i yeah can make that's sure. probably better information than i have my folks uh in, in the notes i have here it just says that they anticipate the grants will be issued by the end of the calendar year in 22 so that would lend itself to later this summer, I would think. Yeah, and they, uh, the original pot from Bill uh, has been matched by some, another funding pot, which is gonna double that funding available, that number you gave of the 180 million, I believe. Um, and what that did or should affect is that allows half of the money to not have to go to communities that have um, the roofing ordinances in place. So that was kind of a piece with that at one new program. So everything else you talked about is existing programs, but you did throw in there and we didn't kind of hit Very a little. Well. There is the CWDG. Um, good question about biomass. How are we going to deal with all the biomass from these ramped up mitigation projects? So um, there's a couple of options there. Biomass is always an issue, right? And so one of the things that we've done uh, around the region, and actually other regions are starting to do this now too, we have developed um, a blanket purchase agreement that is, you know, we will get contractors on board, uh, and then we'll start offering task orders off of that, um, off of that uh, blanket purchase agreement. We're hoping that's going to be a, a much more efficient way to um, get um, options out for treatment on the landscape. We are seeing more opportunities. Uh, you know, we have the biomass facility in Gypsum, Colorado, that we feed. Uh, we've been feeding a, a lot of a lot of material to, and we're hearing rumors of other opportunities coming online. So I think all is not lost on the biomass front. You know, the thing for, for me that that you know the, the states that have been very successful around uh, biomass uh, power generation all have subsidies. Um, and so that, that's a challenge that we're facing. You know, we, wind energy and solar energy is big in this state and they have subsidies. And so we, we don't have that same subsidy for wood, wood fired uh, power generation, but there are new technologies coming online uh, and it's gonna take a paradigm shift for us to really move the needle on it. But there, uh, again, there's, we are seeing some, some promising, um, promising uh, signs that that could be changing. Great, thank you. Um, and just a question of the 600 targeted jobs you're trying to fill, do you know how many of those have been filled? And I guess the question then is also how many of those got filled by somebody moving from a different position that's not yeah. me. 
<laughs> yeah, that's the real thing. Um, so we've tried to be real deliberate about um, the hiring. So we're, we're doing a lot of national hiring events now. And so those national hiring events, lend, uh, many of them are geared towards entry level positions. And so we're trying to bring those folks in from outside of the agency to help alleviate some of the some of the very concerns you're talking about. But you know, there's no doubt. I mean, there's gonna you can't deny folks promotions, right? So um, there's there's gonna be some of that that happens. Now, how many have we already filled? We've probably advertised over half of those positions, with probably half more to come. Um, and what success rate are we had? It depends. For we just had an engineering hiring event. We probably had about a 30% success rate on that one. Um, with the forestry event, we're probably more like 65%. Uh, so, and then we have a recreation one going on right now. So um, sometimes, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's a learning curve, to be honest. We're not the best recruiters and, um, and we've got to do a better job. And actually the region's making some investments in hiring a regional recruiter so that we can really get into schools, get into communities and try to drum up interest in some of our jobs. Thank you. Um, let's take one more question from Brad. And then I think there's some questions regarding landscape a little bit in the chat as well, but um, go ahead, Brad. Yeah, well, I think Pat Dorsey was kind of echoing part of my comment. You know, I was looking at those focal areas, Steve, and thanks for all that, all the work. I know the Forest Service has done a lot of work on like figuring out what to do where and how to focus and it's all good stuff. Just when you're talking about water, for those of the, you that, that know me, you know this it's going to come down to watersheds and water supply. But um, we talk about water, especially for the front range, it's like 80% of it comes from the West Slope. And so, and I know that um, the prioritization pieces in the state's done a similar prioritization that's come up with some of the same focal areas. But it didn't, even though you have some of your you know, your goals to protect water, it's like the water component was not part of that prioritization exercise. So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, a little bit of what Pat put in hers, which is like, how are we going to determine that next round of, of funding to really start, start getting that water component a little bit more into that prioritization piece? Yeah, Brad, thanks for the question. That's a good one. Um, I, I can, I can tell you that, um, you know, from my perspective, we have been investing in the West Slope. We'll continue to do that. Now, the, the, the one thing, and, and Cindy Dozier and I have talked about this, the, you know, some of those rural watersheds, I mean, you, they have one intake. And if, they're, if their water supply goes, then they're in a bad way. And so we've begun discussions uh, working with um, Club 20 about what we can do about that. And so I think there's a path forward for us there. I do think moving forward, we can't just always focus on the front range. It's not, it's not helpful. And, you know, to be honest, you know, RMRI is in Southwest Colorado. And that was, that was the first thing we really let out with as far as priorities go. Uh, under the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative. And so, and also you see where the CFLR project was funded was down there as well. So, so we understand uh, keenly uh, around some of those projects, some of those areas that really need some project work done. You know, I'll give it gypsum as an example. You know, that gypsum watershed, they, they've had scares a couple of years in a row and hell, we have a power plant right there. And so we've got to do a better job of working with those communities that actually have the infrastructure to support the work. And so I think that's that's all on the table and, and we really need to do a better job. But the one thing that I, I you know, challenge some of the West Slope providers to, to do is collectively get together and, uh, and talk to us uh, collectively. And so we can figure out how we can make bigger strides on the landscape. I think there's opportunities for that. And I think we, we can do that. Um, you know, it's, it's uncertain to me how the 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 push to work in these focal landscapes is gonna impact out years, right? So we, we know we got the money, we, we got 18.1 million for the front range this year. There's a high degree of uncertainty about what's coming next. And so we have to be prepared. Uh, and so it's gonna to continue to pay uh, for us to work with our, our providers on the West Slope as well. I know that's kind of a, it wasn't a, a direct answer, but it's as good as I can give you, sorry. Thanks, Steve. No, I think that was, I think you 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 did the best job you could do with that. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. And that's actually a great segue with all of that uncertainty to our next presenter, Ian Barrett, with the U.S. Department of Interior Bureau of Land Management. Um, so thank you so much, Steve. Hopefully, we'll still have some time for questions at the end. Um, 
Ian recently moved to this position as the fuels program lead for the Bureau of Land Management Colorado State Office. Um, he was previously down here in Southwest Colorado in my neck of the woods, and he's a great and practical advocate for forest management. Um, unlike the USDA, that's primarily US Forest Service to apply this infrastructure funding support uh, to for landscape restoration, Department of Interior has to split this between the Park Service, BIA, Fish and Wildlife, and the BLM to sort out how the bill will be implemented. So there's still some uncertainty there, and I really appreciate Ian being willing to come in and share what he does know so far, and especially to help you all understand how BLM's existing community assistance and fire assistance programs work. So thank you, Ian. Thanks, Becca, and uh, appreciate everyone who's presented beforehand. It highlights a lot of the areas where BLM is actively engaged as a partner. Um, so as, as Becca mentioned, uh, fire in the bill for DUI is coming down to, at least for within the fuels program, to the Office of Wildland Fire, WF. And uh, BLM Colorado uh, has not received any uh, funding at this point. So I'm going to speak about fuels program and, and what we do, and then uh, you know, potentially um, how, how the, the mechanism of uh, how funding would, would come across to collaborators. So the BLM Fuels Program has two components um, with how it works to uh, reduce fuels, uh, both on BLM lands and across the boundary. Um, the program that works outside of BLM lands is called Community Assistance. And that's what I'll highlight today. Um, it works with communities, partners, NGOs, uh, government or other government organizations, uh, private homeowners. And uh, the, the hope is to educate and also treat reduced fire risk. So bill funding has been allocated into, uh, to help increase the amount of acres BLM is able to treat. Um, you know, fairly, fairly clear. Uh, there are specific bins and uh, the bins are things such as prescribed fire, thinning, working with partners and collaborators. So community assistance is that program that help develop projects across the landscape and BLM helps uh, meet private landowners to strengthen the work that's done on both ownerships and meets the BLM criteria. It, it is worth mentioning, at least uh, in the language, that it, it does need to have a BLM nexus, so it's, it's that cross-boundary work. And, um, to support what I'm saying about community assistance, and I'm sure it'll be better than I can do, I'm just uh, putting a link in the chat uh, to navigate you to a nice overview video of, of the CA program, as we call it. Uh, you can scroll down on that page at your leisure. Won't take up too much of your time today. Um, one way CA projects can be accomplished is through assistance agreements, or what a lot of folks like to think of as grants. Um, these projects. Uh, are things that are you would apply through grants.gov and then the BLM uh, would evaluate and uh, allocate money towards. So that funding can be transferred to a group that can carry out uh, treatments or educational efforts or a, a lot of different criteria have, uh, outlined in that notice of funding. Um, so the amount of funding available annually for both CA projects as well as the capacity overseas projects is a limiting factor, and all applications are welcome. So I encourage uh, people to navigate to that. Um, one tool the BLM is using with other agencies is Good Neighbor Authority, and we're going to hear about that next. Um, it helps us enter agreements with state, local, and tribal entities to work on these projects. So that's a really brief overview. I'd like uh, I encourage folks to navigate to the link I provided. And that's what I have for everybody today. Thanks. Thank you so much. There's more to come, but any, any quick questions on uh, community assistance for Ian? And feel free to drop them in the chat as we go as well. So thank you so much, Ian. Um, I'm going to turn this over next um, to Matt Etzenhauser. Um, Matt has served as the Regional Good Neighbor Agreement Appraisal and Timber Sale Preparation Specialist for the USDA Forest Service Rocky Mountain region for the past seven years. Prior to that, he spent 11 years managing the timber program for the Gunnarsson Ranger District on the GMUG National Forest. 
and six years in the private sector conducting inventory and sustained yield modeling for large industrial private landowners in North Carolina. Matt earned his BS degree in force management and master's of science, uh, both from CSU, so another CSU alum. Um, Matt, go ahead and take it away and I'll unspotlight. Uh, oh, I think we got that. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. Um, just uh, one quick correction. I, I worked in the private lands in Northern California. I was it, uh, in the South with Steve down there. So <laughs> just a clarification, but uh, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, we're still getting the side. Uh, it's not playing yet, um, but. Okay, that should be there now. Yep. All right, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the chance to speak with everybody this morning. And um, as was mentioned, I'm gonna kind of highlight the Good Neighbor Authority some of the asks and try to tie in uh, how the bi um, bipartisan infrastructure law funding might be playing into how this, how we implement good neighbor in the, in the next few years. So, uh, seems a little hard to read here for me. Get a better. So the, the Good Neighbor Authority allows the U.S. Forest Service to partner with um, state agencies, counties, and tribes and to undertake restoration treatments and activities on federal land in addition to similar and complementary restoration activities on non-federal lands. And I would <clears throat> just say, um, you know, that the Good Neighbor Authority really isn't like a program with funding associated with it. It's just a tool we have to be able to do implementation. And so there's some some good aspects of how this tool 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 is designed to let us work across boundary and be more efficient on the work that we're doing on the ground. But that's really where the the benefit of good neighbor comes from. And so I would say that everything we've heard about today and all the different programs and funding sources would be eligible. You know, good neighbor could be plugged into those type of projects where it makes sense uh, to get the work done uh, more efficiently. And it kind of ties into this whole idea of um, being able to work across boundaries uh, on federal and non-federal lands. Um, <clears throat> so the idea of the uh, yeah, the complementary and um, similar restoration activities, uh, you know, that ideally that should be adjacent land, uh, you know, both jurisdictions or multiple jurisdictions where the treatment is kind of bundled across, you know, all that landscape that needs to be treated. But there's a really where you take a really flexible interpretation of that, and so a lot of our projects are just solely on national forest lands, or BLM is similar, um, or they can also be not directly adjacent. So uh, it's kind of a an interpretation of a, more of a lar longer temporal scale and maybe a longer or larger spatial scale in terms of how we how we define that complementary and um, similar activity. So that's uh, usually not a, a, a restriction on on these projects that you have to have that adjacent uh, treatment all the time. And, but I would say the you know the target and the objective of Good Neighbor is really to to be able to bundle all those treatments into one um, one activity, and that's really where the benefit comes from. So I would say like the our vision for the Good Neighbor uh, implementation and Probably the, like the ideal case scenario would be uh, where there's collaboration. So you're, you know that's where you're bringing in all the stakeholders and having that support to do the work, uh, and then multiple jurisdictions. <clears throat> so that <clears throat> kind of the idea with that is, you know, we have a landscape that and the fires don't stop at the boundary or the issues don't stop um, at the ownership boundaries, and and we need have this need to be comprehensive in our treatments. And uh, if we were to bundle them into separate contracts and treat like the 10 acres on the private land and then 60 acres on the national forest land and another five acres on some state land, have, that was like three contracts to get that amount of acres treated. But if we can bundle them all into one contract and put it under one entity, which is, is usually the state, or it could be a county or a tribe using their own contracting method. and. Um, <clears throat> It's a lot more efficient. We don't have to advertise and award each one. We can and also attract um, some of the operators and uh, contractors that are 
that wouldn't even look at smaller projects just for economies of scale, but we can attract kind of that larger market. And also that pl plays into uh, being able to use a lot, utilize the wood products. If we can bundle enough wood volume, you know, we could get some of those industry partners in, interested in uh, participating in those kind of projects. So it really makes a lot of sense when we can bundle things together and put them all into one in one project. And then the other, <clears throat> other ideal, uh, Kind of criteria would be partner support, uh, that, that, and it's uh, grassroots kind of lo local initiative. So you know we have that uh, tie-in with the local community, and then as I mentioned earlier, the um, gaining those efficiencies of being able to bundle the work. Our strategy with the U.S. Forest Service is to uh, be as flexible as we can. Um, so there are some things we can't be flexible about, like the laws and regulations that we need to follow. But if it's just a policy issue or something like just this is the way we always do business, you know, we're allowed to back off on that and let the partners kind of do business under their methods. That uh, that's really where the you know the uh, benefit of good neighbor comes in is that we can you know whoever's doing the work and and that work on the ground doesn't have to worry about a bunch of different agencies and their regulations. They just deal with the one partner that they're used to dealing with and. Uh, and under their process and that and just makes it more efficient that way and then we also are part of our strategy is we want to be uh, creative and look for those win-win situations where you know the cross-boundary work is available and there there's stakeholders that are interested in doing the work and we can bring all the partners together put it under one state or county or tribal contract and um, you know get the work done all, all together so i just w I wanted to highlight uh some of the unique features of the good neighbor agreements. So a lot of you have probably worked with cost share agreements or other types of agreements with federal agencies. And uh, there are some pretty unique things to good neighbor that, that can make it stand out for certain projects. Uh, and one is that um, <clears throat> it allows the timber revenue that's generated to be kept by the state partner. So in this case, the current law only allows uh, state agencies to hold that revenue, but there is talk of the next legislation round, they'll probably add um, counties and tribes into that. So it's, it's, it's similar to stewardship contracting where the value of the wood product can then be put back into the landscape, put back onto the projects. That's, that's a unique aspect. There's only two different types of agreements in the Forest Service where you can sell wood products, which is the second feature I wanted to talk about, and that'd be a stewardship agreement or the good neighbor agreement. So. Sometimes we can get work done cross boundary with like a cost share agreement and using the widen amendment. But in those those type of agreements, there's no way to utilize the wood products or account for that. So if your project has that aspect to it, uh, you would wanna use the good neighbor. Um, and it doesn't require any match uh, from the partner. And the contracts can be awarded um, and administered without the majority funding requirement. So a lot of the federal contracts would require whoever's Whichever partner is putting in the most money, then have to use their type of con or their contracting mechanism. So, if federal mo partner was putting in the majority of money, we'd have to use a federal contract. But under Good Neighbor, uh, we can put in 100% of the money, and we can still use a state or county contract. But <clears throat> that's a lot more flexibility there, and they can be up to 10 years in length. So, as far as um, investment in Colorado. Uh, these are, this is the investment over the years, uh, so it's been you know kind of up and down. Uh, our biggest year was in 2020, where we put a little a little over four million dollars into uh, good neighbor agreements that year. And then this year, um, to date, we've put 107,000. Uh, there's a couple that are in the works of being finalized that haven't been totally committed yet, but um, that's kind of the the scale of, of where we've been operating. If you look at region wide. Um, <clears throat> We're about $12 million in all the states in the region. So Wyoming, Nebraska, South Dakota. Uh, we don't have any in Kansas right now, but uh, and that gives you a scale that Colorado's uh, definitely been getting the majority of the support for Good Neighbor so far. Um, and I would, in Colorado, we have six master agreements, uh, and those are with five different uh, agencies, the Colorado State Forest Service, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Colorado Department of Ag, we have one with Garfield County uh, and one with uh, DNR um, 
Department of Mines and Reclamation. So it's a pretty variety or a pretty wide range of uh, agencies we're cooperating with. And we have 38 um, current GNA projects and 32 of those are active. So we finished six of them, but and a lot of those will extend, um, you know, they get modified year after year as funding comes in. So they're, uh, they're kind of a long-term type of a project like that. And as far as uh, future funding, uh, you know, Steve had mentioned the 18.1 million that um, is expected to come this year. And that's, that's not just good neighbor. I mean, that's all of the treatment that we're doing on the front range forest there, but that could be so that money, if it's decided that Good Neighbor is the right implementation tool that can be funneled into using, um, you know, Good Neighbor projects. And so the, the Arapahoe Roosevelt uh, does have a project, uh, Cherokee Park, that they're planning to utilize some of the infrastructure funding. And then Pikes Peak uh, area on the Pikes and Isabel is also developing some Good Neighbor. But I, I just wanted to highlight in this, uh, in the infrastructure bill, there was 160 million uh, set aside just for uh, Secretary of, you know, U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, Forest Service, and uh, that's set aside <clears throat> for tribes, states, and counties to to use uh, for good neighbor projects. And I haven't, that money hasn't really trickled down yet into our region that I know of um, where that would be going. But that'll be, you know, in the future, uh, we'll see where, you know, how that gets allocated. I think they're still kind of working out some of the details on that. And uh, Steve had kind of already talked about this, the priority for the uh, f first round of investments is kind of this front range area. And I was gonna jump into a case study, but I, for the sake of time, I think I'll uh, I'll just highlight the, the benefits of this study. This was the Steamboat Front project. And uh, it, got, it was implemented over three years and there was a significant cost savings, which then allowed us to uh, get more land treatment treatment done. Uh, so this last slide here shows the final results. All the, the red polygons are national forest lands that were treated. The yellow are adjacent private. And then there was a small um, section of uh, right next to the ski area that the town of Steamboat Springs had funded. Um, but the, the, advantage of the advantages of this uh, project were that the state had already developed a relationship with the operator that did the mastication. And so that's why the price was so good. Um, they had, you know, the, the risk was pretty low to the operator. They, they understood how that work gets to be, is done with the state administering it. They felt pretty comfortable in giving us a real low price. And they also had a kind of a down window where they wanted to keep their equipment and operators running. And so the state was able to move really quickly and capture that opportunity for the, uh, the contractor, which under a federal contract, we probably wouldn't have been able to move that quickly. So that really helped to get the cost down. And the <clears throat> operator also made an offer to the adjacent landowners that he would, uh, he or she, I'm not sure who, uh, what gender was the owner of that company, but he or she would honor the, uh, the price for the adjacent land. And so a lot of the private landowners jumped on and paid that low price. And they, it was a good selling point because they could see the results on the other side of the fence. And so, yeah, that looks really good. I want to do that on our land too. And uh, able to kind of get a lot of buy-in from the private landowners into the project. So a lot of uh, <clears throat> good benefits that kind of came out of the reason that we were using Good Neighbor. <clears throat> and I guess uh, with that, I'll just uh, turn it over for questions and the timing's working out pretty good here. <laughs> so we've got seven minutes left. Thank you. Yep, perfect. Um, yeah, so what questions do you all have for Matt or for our other presenters today um, before we wrap up? That was really helpful uh, to get a picture of that GNA. So thank you. Um, I know I'm really curious because Ian also mentioned Good Neighbor Authority and that BLM can enter into Good Neighbor Authority projects. And um, I appreciated you sharing all the different partners that you have master agreements with. So um, can you just a little bit, what kind of entity do you have to be to enter into an agreement uh, with the federal agency? So the the only uh, direct partnerships we can have under Good Neighbor would be with um, states, counties, or tribes. That could, you know, any entities within those groups. 
the counties can conservation districts uh, can enter in because they're part of a county entity in, the, in some certain ways when they're organized that way. So that would be qualify. And I would say like a, a general partner or general nonprofit uh, collaborative type group could work, could be involved as like a third party, um, you know, either partnering probably, you know, through the state as in bringing in kind, uh, you know, match and those kind of things. But as far as a direct agreement, it has to be one of those agencies. Okay. I'm curious also how creative we've talked about all of these federal funding mechanisms today, uh, which all typically require environmental analysis to be approved for whatever lands that funding is being um, applied to. But I'm curious if there's any, you know, matching of funds for different pieces of projects to make things um, work differently with some support with administration or with like the matching agreement that you talked about with the mitigation contractor um, who said, well, we'll keep this rate, but we're doing a kind of a separate project for you on these private lands. How has that looked in the past? Well, the, the matching, um, it, if it's federal funding, then we have to uh, have all our environmental um, studies and NEPA, NEPA clearance and archaeology and all that, those kind of things. Um, but a lot of times if the if the funding's coming through another source, then we can do that cross boundary treatment and under one contract without having uh, without having that extra federal uh, you know compliance regulations applied to it. Cool. And then I um, watching for questions in the chat and feel free folks to raise your hands. I I guess I'll ask the rest of our presenters as well if you want to um, come on camera so people can remember um, who's been sharing. That would be great. Um, and we have time for just a couple of questions. And then I, we're also going to launch a poll here, just a quick core question evaluation for you all for how this went and how to do these better in the future. Um, I know for my part, I'll probably be planning a follow-up on the community wildfire defense grants as more information rolls out about those, uh, which are really for implementation and development of community wildfire protection plans. Um, and I'm just stalling, waiting to see if anybody else has any questions, because there was a lot of information that we got today from everybody. Um, so thank you so much uh, to all of you, all of our presenters for taking the time today. Um, thank you to all of the planning team for helping to put this together. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share this evaluation, uh, but feel free for the next couple of minutes if you'd like to, if you still have a question, um, please feel free to, to drop it in the chat or come off mute. Um, as we wrap this up, and we would appreciate it for those of you who are still on if you take just a minute to answer questions before we drop off, although we've already lost some of you, so. <laughs> it was really helpful. There's a lot of programs and they're still, you know, I only heard a tiny bit of money that's actually trickled down and been allocated so far, so um, getting to that we're obviously going to keep hearing and learning a lot more um, over the next few months and even the next year as uh, we see some of that spending plan, the different spending plans um, evolving with different programs, with new programs taking a little bit more time to get on the ground. Um, this was recorded and we will be, I'll remind all of the presenters to please um, send me a PDF if you had slides or if there's any notes or links that you would like to share. I will pull the ones that you dropped in the chat and um, we'll work to get that posted and out to everybody who registered for this meeting um, sometime next week. Okay. Thank you, Becca. And hey, real quick, everyone, I just wanted to say, um, yep, I just got the solicitation for um, Joint Chiefs, so. Cool. It'll be, it'll be coming to a landscape near you.
is there a, a link that goes with that yet? But no, no, we just got okay. the internal, but I, I, it made it to the States from national headquarters. So. Very cool. That's yep. awesome. Yeah. I was curious about that same question, you know, joint chiefs, we talk about trying to get as much going on private lands, but one of the challenges to that is that one I brought up about, you know, you have to have NEPA for all of that as well. Um, you do. And, and one real last super, super quick thing. I know most people are dropping off, but um, I didn't get to mention that there is a, a mechanism called area-wide planning, which is a whole landscape planning um, process that NRCS with a sponsor can, um, and it has to be with a sponsor um, outside the federal government that can um, oversee all the NEPA across all the lands and coordinating that. So Area-wide planning, um, if, if anyone's interested, feel free to reach out to me and um, we can talk about that. And that opens up a huge net for NEPA-based project um, approval and, and the like across multiple jurisdictions, federal jurisdictions and programs. Cool, great. Well, thank you so much. We are at time and it looks like most people, some people have participated in the evaluation. So. Um, thank you everybody who was able to do that and have a great rest of your week. I'm going to leave it open for just a minute in case anybody's wrapping that up, but have a great day. Thanks everybody.